Kept you waiting, huh? In this final entry in the MGSV tape investigation about Chico's recordings in Ground Zeroes, I'll be taking something of a step backwards from my normal theorizing and extensive, if not often tangential, footnotes to address a bigger, more fundamental question. What purpose do Chico's tapes actually serve? Put simply, Chico's tapes are disturbing. They're extremely graphic in their depictions of sexual assault, torture, and rape. And for many critics, they didn't seem to justify themselves artistically in any way. Were the Chico tapes really just about being edgy or making players sick? I claim resoundingly, no. To the contrary, the tapes not only feed your journey across Ground Zeroes into the Phantom Pain, making you feel almost morally complicit in the tragic final weeks in the lives of Chico and Paz, they are the ultimate use of games as an interactive medium to showcase trauma, as well as a revolution in what can only be called the micro-genre of procedural investigation adventure. And as we'll see by the end of this video, they also completely embody many of the central themes of the wider experience that is MGSV. Formally speaking, the use of tapes, not unlike how prior MGS games relied on so-called codec sequences, owe a lot to a medium that's popular in Japan and the UK and used to be popular in the States, radio dramas. But unlike on the radio, the key feature, obviously, of a video game is interaction and repeatability. In several interviews around the same time as the release of MGSV, Kojima repeatedly stated a desire to use modern technology and design methods to return with this game to aspects from the early days of video games. The mostly mute protagonist Venom Snake, for example, Kojima directly compared to how originally gaming characters were voiceless. He's also stated that, thanks to the influence on him offered by the arcade era, most if not all of his games rely on replayability as a central conceit, on repeating the linear elements of the game in non-linear and often emergent ways, ways that like playing through your favorite arcade game over and over again as you learn how to play it and find little secrets change over time. Arguably, the use of tapes, which began with Peace Walker, bloomed with Ground Zeroes, and fully flowered with The Phantom Pain, represents the culmination of this tendency towards replayability and the intersection of it with narrativity that's defined Kojima's entire career. But unlike any MGS before, and unlike either Peace Walker or The Phantom Pain, the context for Ground Zeroes is specifically of a crime as a kind of murder mystery. This refers not only to what happens to Chico and Paz, but to the horrible disaster that confronts us when we return to Mother Base, only to see it destroyed. Speaking of criminality and behavior outside the norm, sexual deviancy and nonconformity has always been part of how this series has shaped the psychologies of its characters, sometimes for laughs, sometimes more crucially. But with the horrors of Ground Zero's tapes, this question of sexuality and society for the first time completely intersects with the wider fundamental game themes. MGSV at large, after all, from Ground Zero's to The Phantom Pain, will explore topics relating to morality, society, power, free will, responsibility, gender norms, and the law. It begins with the rape and murder of two adolescents, and ends with the player ourselves having to mass murder our own in-game family, more or less, something arguably foreshadowed in the related project, PT. And all along the way, guilt and shame that surrounds the events that we hear on these tapes will dog our trail. Paz and Chico's ghosts come back to haunt us, while Skullface's inhuman atrocities are never really revenged. Their deaths, in a way, really do come to serve as a message that ours is a society that murders the innocent. And in how they haunt us, the tragic lives of the fictional characters Chico and Paz arguably contain the power to genuinely change the world. Believe it or not, I claim the Chico tapes are actually to an extent about empathy, about showing the player firsthand the consequences of traumatic violence, which often can stay with survivors for their entire lives. There's a lot to find hidden in these seven tapes, but ultimately nothing in them can really change the awfulness of what they record. Nothing can change the events that transpire within them. 
In the end, the tapes are a kind of comment, perhaps, on the nature of our minds as story machines, ones that do not search out pure truth, but a subjective, narrative-based construct that merely models reality. It all goes back to what Skullface says to the suffering prisoner, who may as well be the player ourselves. Confronted by the unknowable, by oblivion, feeling the pain of ages, confronted by severe trauma, our minds get to work weaving these nearly random fatalistic events into what we take to be patterns that have explanations. Into, in other words, interpretations. But crafting these interpretations keeps our traumatic memories on loop, perhaps, turning them into repetitions of a game that we can't help but never stop playing. Whether as a third-party investigator or as a survivor ourselves reliving phantom pain that we've suffered, the way that our minds work compels the construction of these interpretations, these stories. Stories to guide our way through this burning world, as our bodies lie writhing in whatever factory first burned us. But just as MGSV overall seemingly seeks to show, in the absence of solid facts, humans are capable of believing almost anything, so long as it breaks the deadlock. What's brilliant about Chico's tapes is how it shows firsthand how this drive for stories can be hijacked and turned against us. At bottom, what this storytelling drive represents is the capacity, in a way anyway, for language. In the late 20th century, tapes, after all, were how many people around the world would learn a new language. As the vocal cord parasites in the phantom pain will make clear, when learning a language, repetition and instruction is obviously key. But language debatably does more than record conventions in the form of sound. As George Orwell's 1984 conveys by the inclusion of a glossary that just goes into all the ins and outs of the actual language and the principles underlining that language of Ingsosh, the one-party state that's presented in the novel, language can also preserve interpretations of a wider society, interpretations of history. Language can help structure a speaker's own sense of identity. As Nietzsche says, the spiritual activity of millennia is deposited in language. The way that Skullface indoctrinates Chico and Paz, both of them at a formative age, is not unlike teaching them a language. But the more that we as investigators try to piece together what took place in Ground Zeroes, the more that we inadvertently expose ourselves to Skullface's language, his little lessons, his way of interpreting the world. It's something that he passes on to us. It's difficult not to come away from a close study of Chico's tapes with this sense of Skullface's perspective. The tapes double almost as Orwellian propaganda geared to engender a particular mode of thought, Skullface's mode of thought. I argue this works to make the case that, as the opening quote of The Phantom Pain conveys, our native tongue is our true fatherland. Yet just as Skullface wants retribution for having his stolen from him, by trying to comprehend Skullface's words and deeds, we cannot help having our own mother tongue stolen from us, even if only momentarily and contextually within the game. This seems to challenge the liberal notion known as the marketplace of ideas, and even possibly the liberal value of absolute free speech. Will the best, healthiest ideas win out? Or does the battle over hearts and minds manifest a battle of raw power, a battle between the powerful and the defenseless? Can might truly make right? The specter of Nazism and totalitarianism in MGSV makes this point clear. It was by exploiting liberalism and ideas like the marketplace of values and free speech that Nazis can come to power. Uh, because to them, might does make right. Skullface employs every cheap manipulative trick not unlike the Nazis in the book, and in the end he wins friends and influences others. Chico and Paz come to accept, through a process not unlike grief, Skullface's inculcation completely. One of the saddest moments in the Ground Zero's tapes happens at the end, when Paz confesses that it was the idea that Chico and she could possibly survive this nightmare together, an idea implanted in her by Skullface, that finally worked to break her down. The idea that people can always overcome so-called evil by the virtue of truth or justice or morality Ground Zeroes completely destroys, just like Orwell's tragic and haunting 1984. Every person has a breaking point, a point where, by raw exertion of force over them, they can be made to accept whatever story that they need to, to survive. 
the liberal notion of a marketplace of ideas, is exposed as just another power fantasy, as if there's anything or anyone to protect good ideas from bad. Again, Nietzsche said it best, to use the same words is not a sufficient guarantee of understanding. One must ultimately have one's experiences in common." End quote. You too have known loss, and that loss torments you still. You hope hatred might someday replace the pain. But it never goes away. It makes a man hideous inside and out. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> we both are demons. Our humanity won't return. You, me, we've no place to run, nowhere to hide. That is why I'll show you my demon. Uh, don't misunderstand this. Good remains distinct from bad and right from wrong, whether we can see the distinction or not. This is an aspect to the perspectivist philosophy of Friedrich Nietzsche that many people over the years have misunderstood. Nietzsche believed in morality. Nearly everything that he wrote was advocating one form of moral ideas contrary to another. Though he was hardly a systemic thinker and actually disdained all systemic thinkers, Nietzsche's point was that nothing guarantees people in practice will be wise enough to know good from bad or right from wrong. Uh, Nietzsche did not, you see, believe in free will in the liberal conception of that phrase. This theme of free will and interpretations begins with Chico and Paz before really germinating with the child soldiers in the Phantom Pain. In America, we typically believe that only children are incapable of being judged as moral agents because they can't tell apart right from wrong on their own. But what guarantees that they'll ever get a chance to? We assume that rationality and maturity leads the way to a rational conception of right and wrong, but the process of maturity is one where these ideas, this language of morality that they're exposed to in their youth shapes them by way of experience and by the role models that they encounter. The idea that in general individuals will always or even generally grow up to be fully responsible for their own mistakes as their own person, it just ignores the problem which MGSV identifies as sins of the father. Skullface, who basically adopts Chico and Paz to some extent in the tapes, embeds his sins into them. This is why the Chico and Paz tapes are so important. Like the later child soldiers, neither Chico nor Paz ever have a chance. Their fates are basically sealed from the start, outside their control according to someone else's decisions. If individuals never get a chance to grow into their own as rational agents, arguably they can never truly know on their own right from wrong. Twisted by the teachers, parents, and priests who obstruct their way, their growth, Children are often molded, arguably, according to society, to a societal context, and according to what serves that context's interests. These individuals, like the child soldiers or like Chico and Paz, can often be trapped by their own society because, like any prison, there's no escape. If there's a true right and wrong, there's nothing to ensure, in short, that individuals will innately come to see it. And Skullface's sadism and inhumanity are all the perfect cases in point which drives home the importance of Chico's tapes. Skullface tortures Chico and Paz almost as a performance. It's for our benefit, to show the listener what he feels, what he's had to endure from the day that his native tongue, his humanity, his culture was burned out of him. This theme of cycles of violence and abuse plays out interactively in MGSV as players re-experience the trauma in Ground Zeroes over and over again starting, of course, with the tapes. But sympathy for the devil only gets you so far. In the end, as the events of the Phantom Pain show, to paraphrase Nietzsche yet again, by chasing monsters, we often risk becoming another monster ourselves. When we gaze at the abyss, the abyss gazes back. Like Chico and Paz, even when we try to do good and remain virtuous, 
as we see in the phantom pain, often this just results in nothing but more suffering that we cause ourselves. Much like Skullface, ironically, we go from the sufferer to the causer of suffering. And this, of course, we saw with Chico, as he gradually goes from someone who's being tortured to someone who's helping torture. Pause. We should consider comparing the rape and traumatic violence from the tapes in Ground Zeroes to radiation, which, warning signs will declare, causes internal contamination. Exposure to suffering and pain as your social context does not better anyone, especially, again as Nietzsche warned, under the guise of Judeo-Christian-like pity. This is another value, apart from the value of the marketplace of ideas and free speech that the game perhaps wants to criticize. Skullface wants everyone on Earth to join him in a brotherhood of loss, and only then will we all in his twisted interpretation become as equals. Writing injustices is important, but sometimes words, words like justice, truth, liberty, pity, and equality, are peculiar. Sometimes these high-minded ideals and well-meaning moral sentiments can actually get in the way or even make a situation worse. Chico and Paz, after all, believed in fairness, and that belief was weaponized and exploited as a fantasy against them. Skullface believed in almost divine retribution for the suffering that he endured, and to paraphrase Nietzsche yet again, this handful of virtue was used to evade responsibility for a field full of avarice and vice. One of the most important conceits connecting the Phantom Pain back to the Ground Zero's tapes arguably has to do with the cellular components called the flagellum and the cilium. Ciliary movement, as Code Talker tells us, moves vocal cord parasite eggs to the mouth of a host, which allows them to infect others by speech, by communication, by the basic building block, in other words, of society. Yet this movement is itself a form of transmission, a beating, a rhythm, on the cellular level, that inexorably pushes life along, like the rotating motion of spires within a cassette player. What if ideas are in some sense alive? Alive for as long as we keep repeating them, and expressing them. What if, like viruses and parasites, ideas try to survive and multiply for their own sake, totally regardless of benefit or truth? In MGS1, you'll remember, Solid Snake serves as the vector for the pathogen fox die. What if the contagion of Skullface's point of view, his pitiful language, his dialect of English, through Chico's tapes, is allowed to spread from Chico and Paws to Snake, and then to the player and the entire world? One vector after another, like a cascading domino effect, a chain reaction, like a nuclear explosion. Whatever the case, the Ground Zero's tapes and the narratives that they contain, that we half hear and half invent, are much more than edgy or needlessly shocking. They're at the very core of everything that MGSV sets out to accomplish. Sets out not only to say or show, but to indoctrinate us with, as a means of warning us against all forms of indoctrination, to infect us with via interactivity. I submit that the tapes in Ground Zeroes are there to indoctrinate the player, the investigator, into Skullface's internalized grammar, to induct us into his family, his language, his fatherland. Until next time, boss.